Well, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you all for being here and for having me talking today about normal cellulose. It's a bit different topic um, to continue with Dr. Brelli, but I, will, I hope that I will get you as engaged as she did. So today we'll talk um, about another natural resource, which is like trees. And we are all familiar with trees and we all like trees and we, far than being tree huggers, we really want to make profit out of it. So we know wood products and traditional wood products as we know them for years, we've been using pulp of paper, we've been using cardboard, we've been using paper as a commodity for many applications. We also, would, you, you, we also use wood uh, as timber and lumber for construction, for housing, for flooring, and for more engineering wood uh, products for many other applications as well. But what if I tell you that uh, wood from trees and from other biomass sources can be used as uh, more advanced materials? What if I tell you that you can use wood fibers to prepare films and to make films that will replace those fossil based uh, materials that we use in the packaging industry? And also, what if I tell you that we can use uh, wood fibers for making textiles, to use wood fibers as a less water intensive resource than bottom to make our clothing, like in a very friendly way as well? And some other applications, what about wood fiber for paints or better cosmetics will, be, will make us? look younger and more beautiful over time with good base stuff. Or we can use cellulose to make the, to put them in food to make better improved food products. And even like improve our technologies, our, our tissue engineering, our sensing device and many, many other applications as well. So some of you may be aware of this, but then uh, some uh, I want to share with you why and how can we do this. And the, the, the reason why can we do this is that we are merging a lot of technologies, right? We are working in a multidisciplinary approach to achieve some, some of these applications. And one of them, which is detrimental for this to happen, is nanotechnology. So when we talk about nanotechnology, we talk about size. And despite what people would say that size doesn't matter, size does really matter about. So when we are, um, we also have a little science super leader says that essentially it's invisible to the eye. And we know better because we're scientists. We are, we are all scientists, we really need evidence for what's happening than believing all, only our heart and our feelings, or sometimes my work. But what, what is nanotechnology? So we define nanotechnology as the, the, the interaction or the, the, the mani manipulation of matter at the nanoscale. So we go really, really into the very small particles, and we now we start manipulating these, uh, these materials in, in another scale, and now we are of the sudden we have new phenomena and new properties, biological, chemical, and physical properties that will give birth to a whole new level of materials and, and behavior of the material. So all this applies to all matter, gas, uh, solids, and liquids as well. And I have a couple of examples to show you. So uh, cal calcium selenide, for example, we have um, if it's a solid, there is a semiconductive material in the macro scale, in the bulk. However, when we start like breaking this in, into smaller size particles, and we go to nanoparticles smaller than 10 nanometers, then we start having different quantification of energy on this, on this material. And we are like in, in closing or quantifying this energy in a very small volume, and now we have new properties. So in this case, we have new, new optical properties. So nanoparticles of uh, calcium selenide will have different, will show different interaction with the light, and they will, will have like different colors depending on the size of the particle. In the same case, with metal nanoparticles, so this, are, this, is, this is an example of um, metal nanoparticles that they are made out of gold and, and silver, and depending on the shape and the size of this particle, we can have a solution that we can have a, a different response in the optical. Uh, color that we see with our VR. So this nanotechnology can also be applied to biomass. I mean, in, in, a, in the case of uh, trees or, or biomass, we, we, we have our trees in the macro scale, the big timber tree, and then we started breaking it down into the into smaller scales, and then we start reconstructing the cell wall of the tree, and then we will have these elemental fibrils that they are basically made of a polymer called cellulose, which is uh, the, the, structural, the structural uh, component of, of the tree, and it's on the nanoscale. So we have now um, these nanofibrils that they are uh, packed in different ways, more or less crystalline, uh, crystalline impact, and they will form these cellulosic fibers. I don't know if this works. Okay. 
uh, the cellulose fibers are in the micron scale, so we can see them roughly. We are where, where we arrive, we, we can disintegrate a piece of toilet paper or, or paper tissue, and then we can see the fibers, we can touch them. However, if we go down to the nanoscale, and here is a, a, a reference for you to see where is the nanoscale compared to a, a strain of hair. So it's a very, very, very little tiny fiber, and we disintegrate the cellulose fiber to the nanoscale by different means. We can do this by chemical means or by mechanical disintegration, and then we end up with what, what we call nanocellulose, which is the, the main um, focus of my, of my talk and my research as well. So we don't have like different uh, rock-like particles in the nanoscape, or we can have small fibers that they are at least one dimension is on the nanoscape. So we have nanocellulose with one of the dimensions between 100 and 200 nanometers on scale. And now we have a material that behaves extremely different than the cellulose fibers that we, that we use to make regular paper. Regarding the properties of uh, nanocellulose, when we have them in suspension, we can, we can have a very stable gel, and I brought some for your entertainment <laughs> to show you. So we have, uh, when we suspend microfibers on, in, in water, we have a suspension that we can filter out and make regular paper, right? So when we have nanocellulose with the same concentration, and we have only 2% of solids of this, so this is like really, really little amount, now we have a very strong gel that stays stable there for over a year, if you, if you want to keep it there, and it has a very particular uh, biological behavior, meaning that it will flow differently than the regular fibers. You can like, feel them around. So the, the, the way that this um, material flows and the biology of this uh, material can differ depending on what kind of nanocellulose we have. It can become very fluid when we apply shear or it can also some, in some cases can self-assembly meaning in liquid crystals, the, the stuff that you have on your touch phones, in the, in the, the touch screen. And that, that comes from a tree, so it's like a renewable material. So when we have, um, that's when it's suspended, like, like you have it there. But when it dries, nanocellulose have a very good film formability, so meaning that we can make a very nice film which is strong and it has very good barrier properties, meaning that we can use it to replace the regular plastics. And if you don't believe me, I brought something to show you too, because now, because these fibers are like so small and they're on the nanoscale, again, size matters, we cannot really see the difference between the fibers and we can now make a plastic that is transparent or even translucent or even transparent depending on the color. So here I have a piece of paper and a piece of film of nanocellulose telling me back. <laughs> so on top of that, nanocellulose is from a renewable source, it is biodegradable or biocompostable at the least, biocompatible. And it has a very, very large surface area and a lot of functional hydroxy groups there they are ready for being functionalized and impart new properties that we can now open the, the game for many new applications using cellulose fibers other than paper. So at the Forest um, Products Development Center, where I work at Auburn University here on campus, and you are very welcome to come and see, we have a super, super mass photometer, which sounds very fancy, but it's a grinder. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of equipment that we can, um, where we have the capabilities of make our own nanocellulose. Celeste here, as the, as the, our student, she, is, uh, she just got the presidential fellowship to do her PhD with us on the optimization and the processing of different raw materials focusing on the different um, compositions of the starting material and what kind of properties we will impart to the different nanocellulose and depending on that we will find the best application. There is no good or bad nanocellulose, but there are different grades of nanocellulose that will enable us to use, use them for different and novel applications. And I, and I have to choose for the interest of time some of the applications uh, that we are working on that I wanted to share with you uh, in one of the the works that we are doing in collaboration with the School of Pharmacy and um, University from, from Medellin in Colombia. We are using nanocellulose to encapsulate vitamins, in this case as a model for, for drug delivery. And we can control the way that we encapsulate this and we can aim to control how we deliver this vitamin and how to make it more bioavailable when, when, we, when we take the, our vitamin pills or our, our pills in general. So we use um, uh, some vitamins from the B-complex as an example, and then in our, in, in, in our group we specialize 
inserted in the action. So we have a very fancy nice device that allows us to study interactions at the interfacial level and how these nanocellulose will be able to encapsulate these active ingredients and how can we monitor the release of them at different conditions. So this fancy, fancy uh, device is called quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation monitoring what we call QCMD for simplicity. And then we can make our films of nanocellulose and model it uh, and have a model film with uh, whatever we want to study, absorption and desorption, and then we monitor this with the sensitivity of the, at the nanoscale. So what we did was we mimic the, the conditions of the digestive tract, and then we change the pHs of, the, of our system, and we evaluate how easy is the release of the vitamin from the from the subset of nanocellulose. What we found is that nanocellulose is a really good alternative for the commercially available excipients, and it may be even cheaper, which is a really good news. Plus, you are also taking di uh, dietary fiber, so, so it's like a win-win situation to <laughs> use nanocellulose. Another um, very interesting research that I am not able to talk into details on this because it's, a, it's a, uh, some IPR issues, but we are working on detection devices for different infectious diseases, diseases and this is a, an endeavor that we are having with the, the, another very uh, prominent faculty in our school, Dr. Sara Soudi, and some colleagues from chemical engineering and the, the CDC as well here in Atlanta. So we are using our device to study the interactions between nanocellulose and anti antigens and antibodies of certain diseases, in our case, mosquito transmitted diseases to see if we can come up with a rapid, a cheaper, and a more uh, cast, like custom-made device based on paper or nanocell nanocellulose-based device for rapid detection, especially for those places where there are like very low resource settings and there are not access to electricity and, and the regular diagnostics um, techniques. So we are also uh, complementing this work with Dr. Virginia Davis at Chemical Engineering where they, are, they have a very, already uh, many efforts on nanocellulose uh, microelectronic me uh, mechanical systems or MEMS for uh, detections of, uh, detection of cancer antibodies of nanocellulose. So we are uh, unifying our efforts with, with this group as well. And the last example I want to show you that is related to the previous one, we are modifying our nanocellulose fibers with some polymers and we are create, creating a new material that will allow us to uptake and to detect uh, microcystine and these toxins from the, the, we are probably very aware of this issue with the algae, algae blooms in, in Florida. So when this algae blooms in the, in the sea, then it generates all these toxins that despite the, the fact that the algae dies, the toxin is still there and it's extremely difficult to remove and it's very harmful for us and for the wildlife as well. So our system is based on nanocellulose and also on this QCMD detection system. And we, um, we prove or we, we can uptake up to like two times those um, uh, amount of toxins compared to those cellulose-based systems that they are out there. So these are just examples of what can we do with nanocellulose in our, in our research and how can nanocellulose improve our lives. And I want you to, to think about how, how can nanocellulose improve your life or your research. And I would be very, very happy to talk about this. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. Thank you.